so much. Um, I feel like I also need a headset, but um, they're telling me that we don't need headsets. You can hear us perfectly fine. Um, you can hear me? Yes, yes. Can I get nods? Everyone's good? Yeah, I can't. You're okay. Do you want to sit in not the middle? Really. Are, you, <laughs> are you not lonely over there? Okay, brilliant. Well, thank you so much for joining us. Um, full disclosure, I also work with Sunil at Whisper. Um, so I'm, I'm inside the machine, but today I'm just sitting here asking the questions. And it's great to see all of your faces here. We're going to try and not put you to sleep after lunch. Um, I'm really excited about women's sport in general and the level of visibility we're seeing because I moved over uh, to the UK from South Africa in October last year. And I feel like I'm living in the, honestly, in the future. Because there are things being done here that gives me goosebumps. The progress has been amazing. And I'm not just saying that, it's also reflected in the research. The Women's Sports Trust recently um, released figures that point to the fact that women's sports viewing has literally seen a fourfold increase, particularly around the Barclays FA Women's Super League. Women's sports viewership increased 140% year on year from this time last year to, this, to around May this year. And the numbers are absolutely undeniable. Nearly a third of the UK of people in the United Kingdom, 21.1 million people, have watched sport, women's sport in 2022. That's a massive number considering the low base that we came from just a few years ago. Um, and what's also interesting is that it's not just more people watching, it's also the duration for which they are watching. And that's really crucial. They're not just tuning in, kind of giving it a look, scrolling on their phone and then tuning back out again. They're remaining engaged for a much longer time. Um, the viewing time per person is double that of this time last year. It went from 72 minutes to 149 minutes in only a year. Um, Women's Euros, Wimbledon, the Commonwealth Games, and the World Cups for both Rugby League and Rugby Union, all of these events are still kind of rolling out towards uh, the end of November this year, which means there's still big opportunity for all of these numbers to grow even further. And that's why we've got Jody here, because she's going to be competing in the Rugby League World Cup as a player, hopefully. She's in the England squad, she's probably playing. <laughs> and um, she also works for a Rugby League World Cup. And then, Sunil, you guys are, um, particularly the football side of Whisper, have done such amazing work. There's a massive, if you've ever been to Whisper's HQ and Q, we've got like a whole floor just dedicated to UEFA. But outside of that, the broader football project has got a very exciting period ahead of it in the next few weeks. Yeah, it's, uh, it's thank you very much for uh, turning up to listen. Just for the record, it's incredibly hot here. <laughs> I kind of feel like I'm going to get a tan off this. Um, so. Yeah, look, it's a, it's a big, um, big month coming up. The Women's Euros, it's home Euros. Most importantly, it's on the BBC. Now, why the BBC is important is it gives us a platform. It gives women's sport a platform to really reach the masses. Um, and for us, I genuinely believe we're going to have maybe six or seven occasions this, this summer where we're going to hit figures over 10 million watching women's football. Now, that is a crazy, crazy number. And that's only going to create kind of more exposure for the game. It's going to create role models. Um, it's going to kind of tell stories that are going to engage the next kind of iteration of fan coming through. Um, and it's massively kind of humbling and being privileged to be kind of in charge of that, really. Um, it's amazing kind of walking in from the station and seeing the, the billboards of kind of like Leah Williamson on a Pepsi advert. That's the change we're seeing. And I think this is going to be a huge catalyst because the BBC have given women's sport the platform and the schedule and not buried it away on the red button or online. It's prime time BBC One. It's going to be a game changer. And if you want to see, if you want just a s small preview of what's in store for you on the BBC, take a look at this. It's seeing an opportunity and taking it. Oh, this is sensational! There's a beauty in speed and being close to the edge.
a story of triumph. This is not a story of defeat. These women aren't merely players. They are the best of the best. And the title is surely now Chelsea's. Jamie Chadwick does the double in Miami. Today, the Lord of Inspire, that's us. Here we go. Um, I know the guys who sit in the dark edit suite to craft all of that stuff and put it together. And I know Sunil just cannot help himself. He's always in there. Yes. But that really is proof of you know, the philosophy actually in action. What stands out for you in terms of the images that we saw there? I think it's the, uh, the varied nature of what we've seen over there. When I grew up many years ago watching sport, men's sport, women's sport, in my mind, there were only, it was only really tennis, a bit of athletics where you had female role models. Um, Capriati, Graf, Martina, um, to name a few. These days you can go and watch cricket and you've got at least, uh, you've got rug, uh, cricket with uh, Katie Taylor, you've got Lucy Bronze playing football, you've got Jodie playing rugby league. We're creating role models now. And when you have role models, whether it be in business or sport, it basically gives people an opportunity to aspire to be that next generation. And I think that's what excites me. There's role models in that film now. Um, and people, I believe, at the end of the Euros in particular, that team won't be able to walk down the street without getting stopped for autographs and selfies. And to me, that's a sign of kind of progression. I think more people will get noticed from the women's football team than will be from the Formula One grid at Silverstone at the weekend. People could recognize Lewis, Max, if Ocon walked in here, no one would recognise him. I think Lucy Bronze, come the end of the summer, would get mobbed. You've seen that in rugby league as well, right? Where your audiences have grown, not just the people in the stands, um, but also the platform and the visibility that you've had. Talk to me about that experience for you as someone who's been in the sport for a while. Yeah, absolutely. You know, I've I made my England debut at 17 back in 2009, and I played at, at the top of women's rugby league for many years and it's not until the last sort of three four years that we've seen any real exposure when i first started playing i didn't know that women even had a league to play in i didn't know there was an england women's team so i had no aspirations to go on and achieve that because i couldn't see it and then it wasn't until a coach had to tell me that you know you've got a bit of potential i think you could go on and play for england one day so that was it then i had sole focus that was what i wanted to do I couldn't name you one England player. When I went and, and trained for the first time with England, I couldn't name you one of those England players. Now I could talk to you all day about how brilliant they were as people and as athletes now. Now I've played with them and trained with them. But it was so sad that nobody knew who they were and, and what brilliant things they did. Now I have young girls turning up to games with Cunningham on the back. I've got so many parents who come up to me and talk to me about women's rugby league now and that's never happened before. I've got young girls saying that you're their role model and I do have to pinch myself because it's so new to me but the growth that we're seeing, young girls have the aspiration now to go on and do things. They're already saying at four or five years old, mum, dad, I'm going to play for England one day and they now have the ability to go and shine on, on the top stage. So for me, Having that exposure, being able to be on live, live television, free-to-air television on the BBC with the Challenge Cup that we've seen recently, it's been huge when we look at the investment we've seen. So the people at the top, are obviously, we're having the benefits of it, but not just that, just the amount of young girls that are playing. Just last week, it was the first ever all girls under sevens fixture. Now that might not sound like a lot, but at under sevens, it's mixed rugby league. Um, there's no difference between boys and girls. It's not a boys team and a girls team. But two teams locally had enough girls in, in their club to set up an all-girls team at under-sevens. Now, that's unheard of. If you'd have gone back 10 years, you'd have been lucky to find one girl in a team at that age group. So for me, the added exposure, the profile on television, media, social media has been phenomenal for our game over recent years. What has been the single biggest, if you had to isolate all of those things, all of those platforms that you've now got access to, what's been the one driver that has had the greatest impact? For me, particularly being on that free-to-air BBC, I saw, I mean, we had a couple of games. We had our first ever grand final on, live on Sky uh, back in 2018. 
And then that, that was huge. That was a moment I never thought I'd see. Um, and then the following year, the BBC that said that they were going to show our, our, grand fi our Challenge Cup final live on the BBC platform. And for me as a player, it was an added incentive to do everything I could to get to that opportunity, not just to play in a final and win a trophy, which obviously is brilliant, but to be on live television and be recognised for what we do as athletes was huge. And off the back of that, the amount of people, instead of walking into whatever, whatever place it was, and if I spoke to them about rugby league, I, without doubt, 80, 90% of the time, the comment back would be, you don't look like a rugby player. And it, it always baffled me, that comment, because I, I just used to say, oh, sorry, I forgot to bring my rugby ball out when I left the house today. I don't know what they really expected by that. And then I would have to go on to explain, yes, it's contact rugby league, and yes, it's the same rules, yeah, it's completely the same. And they were quite naive questions. Now that wasn't, you know, they weren't being intentionally, you know, rude or trying to insult me. They just didn't know. Whereas now, usually people coming up to me and they already know I play, or if I say I play, they say, oh, wow, St. Helens won the cup. And that's that exposure on BBC. People just being able to stumble across it and see it, be impressed with the standard because for whatever reason, in women's sport, there's these preconceptions that it isn't entertaining, it's not good to watch. And then as soon as people actually see that and get exposed to it, they realise it's a fantastic quality. And it's not about comparing to the men, actually. It's its own sport, in a way. And there's, there's lots of intricacies that are really exciting about women's sport that make it different to the men's game. And yeah, I just constantly now get so many people recognising what we offer as athletes. We've seen, um, and the research shows this, in rugby union, the the audience is so much younger and so much more diverse than, than for men's rugby union. And that's one of the things that, that's probably one of the biggest reasons that you want to grow a sport in the female direction because you just unlock a whole new generation, full stop, you know? But Sunil, when you're making content and you're thinking about broadcasting, for example, the Rugby League World Cup for BBC, but also the World Feed, how do you balance the avid fan the Jodies who've been around from day one, who know everything about the sport, and also leaving the door open wide enough at the far end of the funnel to bring more people in and have them feel included? Um, that's a good question. I think, from my perspective, it's always been about try being authentic. Uh, never try to patronise people with the knowledge. But if we're to grow the sport, whichever sport it may be, and, and we had it with NFL when we first picked up NFL five or six years ago, it was a similar sort of thing where we had a lot of avid fans in the UK, but the NFL UK came to us and asked, how can you grow the sport? I said, the only way we're gonna do that is if we open it up, broaden it up and bring people on the journey and educate, yeah. educate and build the characters uh, that are involved in the sport. So you've got to create heroes like Jody for people to look up to. Um, so yeah, entertain and educate, would I, I would say. And I love that, and that was the bottom line of the video that we just watched about kind of entertainment being able to change the world, the fact that you can measure the impact of it over the course of a tournament or a season, or as you've just said, a few years. What's interesting about the impact that Rugby League is having is that you guys this year have a World Cup tournament being played, women's, men's, and wheelchair rugby league all at the same time. Has that even been done? No, uh, first time and you know it's not easy and I think it would have been much easier to stick to what we know and I think that's a big part of the messaging when it comes to women's sport and women's marketing and, and disability marketing in the same way. It's really easy to say no and not do it, but actually we have to try and change things and, and the benefits that's come from that, you know, nobody enforced this on the Rugby League World Cup that they had to deliver all three. They just knew it was right for the game of Rugby League and I think we've already seen the benefits before a ball's even been kicked. The growth in the women's game domestically, I think has been a, a large part of that has been because of what this World Cup has already promised to deliver. So the game has to catch up with that. So women's in wheelchairs grown massively and I think a huge part of that is because of the Rugby League World Cup. But not just that, some of the sponsors, the partners that have been brought in to the Rugby League World Cup are completely new to Rugby League. Is the, the numbers and the figures that we're talking about have broke records internationally for, for Rugby League World Cups. And I genuinely believe that's the inclusive nature of what we're trying to deliver. Um, so for me, the, the benefits are just outweigh uh, whatever you can pos whatever challenges you may face. The benefits outweigh that into when you look at the whole package and, and the people you can bring in. You make it an inclusive environment for everyone to feel part of. And then once you have them in, 
How do you turn that into a habit? How do you keep people watching? So they've watched Jody now. The Rugby League World Cup is a lot of fun. It's exciting. England wins it. You know, the women's Euros goes England's way and you have a result there. England also wins the Women's Rugby World Cup, a rugby union down in NZ, and you have all of these champions. These people have all now watched women's, women's sport. How do you retain them going into 23? Uh, from my perspective, it's about continuity and make sure we're not spiking in World Cup years, yeah. losing people and then spiking again in the next World Cup cycle. So it's about that storytelling piece. It's about platforms, whether it be the BBC or kind of World Rugby, um, giving a platform to women's rugby, rugby league, uh, and make sure it's at the forefront so you don't lose and see a drop off. You maintain that audience and keep feeding that audience. So the sports that often struggle that we've worked with are the sports that don't have a regular calendar. So they might be two events in the first quarter and then they don't pop up again until the third, fourth quarter. And by that time, people have moved on. And we're living in a world where we're bombarded with content and you're making decisions all the time. And it's too easy to go, oh, well, I haven't seen it, I've moved on. I'm now into tennis because Drive to Survive equivalents come out. So it's about continuity and platforms investing beyond the big moments where they're going to get the 10 millions. So Whisper as a business has decided to invest and really position, position itself around women's sport. This whole audience is made up of people who work in brands. What would your advice be to anyone else managing a different brand here sitting? Why should they be investing in women's sport? Where are the opportunities here? Um, from my perspective, I think uh, the cost to entry is much more appealing. I think men's sport has already topped out and it's very expensive, high risk to get into. I think women's sport is it a position where it's much more affordable to get in? I think you've got talents such as Jody, by being here, who are making themselves accessible, give you access to the sport. Now, I've worked in sport a long time and I love it, but I do get fed up sometimes where you go to events and it's men's sport and you don't get access to the superstars. Whereas I think in women's sport, they're much more in a moment where they're much more accessible and much more willing to invest like Jody, into their sport to grow it. So to have a brand come on board and, and be part of that journey is, is really uh, appealing. And Jody, what I love about women's athletes right now, and you are an example of this because Jody doesn't only play, she also works for the Rugby Football League um, and she's on a day-to-day -day basis involved in actually getting more girls into the sport and developing the game. I feel like the women's athletes of today are gonna be the administrators and the people really driving it in the next 10 years. 10 years from now, you will probably be leading your sport, not on the pitch, but in the boardroom. Where do you want women's sport to be then, or where do you think it'll be? I think the point that you've made is actually really important. Now that you're growing the profile and and the numbers of, of, of women playing the sport, what, what that means is that there's people in decision-making positions in five, 10 years time, that's what's gonna be the case. And that has never been the case in rugby league before. And these just small decisions that are made that you know that if there was a woman sat at that table, it would have been different. And that's not criticizing the people who are around the table, but you just need that diversity of thought and opinion of people who've lived through it. And um, so for me, I see the Women's Rugby League getting semi-professional. You know, we're really close to that point. We're not there yet, but it has to be done right and in a sustainable way. So, you know, I, I don't think it'll happen in my playing career, but if I can sit there in a boardroom and see the first semi-professional, professional Women's Rugby League player run out on a pitch, it'll be a really proud moment. They've done it in Australia. They can definitely get it done here. So I can't wait to see it happen. Uh, thank you so much for joining us, Jody. Make sure you follow Jody and make sure you watch her play. Um, and all the best of luck, Sunil, with the next few weeks with the Women's Heroes. Yeah, thank you very much. Thanks make, for coming. Make sure you tune in on the BBC. Thank you for joining us. Thank you. Thanks so much, guys.